Father, in the name of Jesus, we bless you, we love you, we thank you for the good word of the Lord. Father, we thank you that every word of God is yes and amen in Christ Jesus. Father, I thank you, Lord, that there is no God like our God who knows the end from the beginning, that the testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. And Father, we thank you, Lord, for the anointing and the power of your Holy Spirit to be upon the spoken word today, to be upon the biblical prophecies, that it will stir our faith, encourage our faith, that we know that there is no God like our God who knows exactly what's going to happen before it happens and has forewarned us and foretold us for the purpose that our hearts not be troubled. And we love you, we honor you, Father. In the blessed name of Jesus our Lord, Yeshua our Messiah, and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen and Amen. So this is part two. My first part was three weeks ago. Um, before I went to the conference and then on to vacation, and Israel's prophetic destiny. I love this picture, by the way. Um, it just shows the line of Judah. I tell people all the time, when Jesus came the first time, he came as the suffering lamb, amen? But when he comes back the second time, he's coming as the lion of Judah, amen? And there is fire in his eyes. You can read in Revelations, amen? His feet like brazen, molten bronze, his hair is white as snow. I mean, he's coming back with a banner that reads King of Kings and Lord of Lords, a two-edged sword coming out of his mouth. Amen? I mean, that's the picture of Jesus. So I want to share with you guys here this morning a quick little review of where we were in part one. First part, we said we need to pray for your enemies. There's a lot of hatred, a lot of animosity, a lot of revenge. And I understand, listen, if somebody came in and murdered your relatives and your loved ones and your friends, um, the last thing you want to hear is the words of Jesus, pray for your enemies. But I'm telling you that as children of light, as children of God, we have to pray even for the wicked and even for the evil. Someone say amen. Even though your flesh may cringe at it, you have to remember Jesus died for them. And the Bible says that God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Did you know that? He takes no pleasure. Now, sometimes it has to happen. I mean, there is a war. There is a time. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 tells us there is a time for peace and there is a time for war. Amen? And Israel's at war right now. But we need to pray for our enemies. We also said we learned biblically about the birth, resurrection, and future of the nation of Israel. God specifically said in the scripture that Israel would be born in how many days? One day. One day. Everybody say one day. one day. Matter of fact, he says, it's amazing. Who has ever heard of a nation being born in a day? Yet we know on May 14th, 1948, in one day's time, because of the vote of the United Nations, Israel was made a historic nation once again, in one day's time, fulfilling that prophecy from so many thousands of years ago. Isn't that amazing? Just one of so many. I love Bible prophecy. It stirs my heart. It stirs my soul. And it just builds so much faith in who God is and in the fact that he is ultimately in control. Amen? As Pastor Carl said in his message Sunday morning, as uh, Friday night, as I've said many times, Heavenly Father is outside of time and space. Amen? And his perspective of time, he sees the beginning, he sees the end, he sees every piece of it all through all. Amen? And he's written these things to encourage his people who are going through difficult times so that we know that God has a plan. Everybody say he has a plan. Yes. How many of you know, even in your own life, when you thought he didn't have a plan, he still had a plan? And he's never late, amen? He's always just in time. And we learned also several weeks ago that the purposes and plans of God will not be thwarted neither by man nor by Satan. Someone say amen. And we also learned the colors of the four horsemen, Revelation 6, 1 through 8, and some of the symbolism of that, of course, each horse is clearly defined in Scripture. You have the Antichrist on the white horse, you have war, you have famine, and then you have death. 
but we also said that the colors of these horses were the white, the red, the black, and the green. And if you look at the colors of the flags surrounding Israel and the enemies of Israel, you will notice something very interesting. That it's all four colors of the horsemen of the apocalypse. And we talked about that. Again, you can go back. Those of you who are viewing by live stream can go back at a later time as well and watch part one. But that was review. So that puts us to today. So today what I want and what I'm praying the Holy Spirit will bring to you is that you and I will learn about the prophecy to bring the remaining Jews back to the land of Israel. Do you know that there is a prophecy about that? And we're going to learn about that because that prophecy has been taking place, but it's starting to go into a different phase. And we're going to talk about that. Also, we're going to learn this morning of the coming conflicts prophesied of Israel and its enemies and how it relates to God's prophetic timeline, God's prophetic clock. And lastly, we're going to learn of Satan's ongoing plan to divide the Holy Land. The enemy always wants to divide what God has promised to the nation of Israel. And uh, we're going to look at prophecy that talks about this, and this is the time in which we live from today forward. And you're going to hear more and more calls for people wanting to divide up the Holy Land. So be warned. So let's get started here this morning with the first one, which is the prophecy in Scripture to restore Jews to the nation of Israel. In Jeremiah chapter 16, verses 14 through 16, the scripture says, Therefore, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that it shall no more be said, the Lord lives who brought up the children of Israel from the land of Egypt. How many of you know that? Right there is a big deal. All of the Jews around the world, myself included, celebrate Passover and have celebrated Passover our entire life in celebration of God bringing the Jewish people out of the land of Egypt into the promised land. But here God prophesies that there is a day in the distant future, he says, when it shall no more be said the Lord lives who brought the children up from the land of Egypt, the children of Israel from the land of Egypt, but the Lord lives who brought up the children of Israel from the land of the what? land of the north, and from all the lands, everyone say all the lands, from all the lands where he had driven them, for I will bring them back into their land, which I gave to their fathers. Now listen to me, right now, there are approximately 16 million Jews around the world, okay? 16 million, everybody say 16 million. And you can fact check me, but, you know, within a million or two, it's pretty close. They're not sure the exact number, but that's what they estimate. So about 16 million, and 30% of that number live in Israel. 50% of that number live in the United States. Most of those in New York City, by the way. And all the other nations, uh, Russia has 3%. I think some of the other countries have 1%, 3%, 1%, 1%, Brazil 1% on down the line. So they're scattered throughout the nations, most of them being in America. So keep that in mind. But this here is a promise that God says that he will bring up the children of Israel from the land of the north and from all the lands where he had driven them. Now, how many of you know that initially started taking place in 1947, 1948, when they became a nation, Jews began to arrive and began to come back to Israel, come back to the promised land from the different nations. But not all of us, right? There's still about, uh, there's 50, there, if there's 30% in Israel, that means there's 70% of the Jewish people around the world not in Israel. 70%. That's a lot, Right? So here God promises he's going to bring them back to their land, which he gave to their fathers. Now, this next verse is where it gets really, really interesting. Because this is where we come into the time period, I think, that just now we're switching over into. Let me explain what I mean. It says, Behold, I will send for many fishermen, says the Lord, and they shall fish them. So, listen to me. I think between um, 1948 until even this year, 
God's been sending fishermen throughout the nation to encourage the Jewish people to come back to their homeland. There are entire ministries that have been established to bring the Jews out of um, Ukraine, out of Russia, out of some of these other nations and bring them back home to Israel. Um, I think like a decade ago, there was a, a, a huge number of Ethiopian Jews who came and were made a part of the nation of Israel as well. And so all during this time, there have been fishermen. How many of you know fishermen? That's a very gentle thing. Have you ever gone fishing, right? Maybe not so gentle for the fish, but it's gentle for you when you're fishing for them, right? But he said, I will send many fishermen, says the Lord. They shall fish them. But look at this. This is something that a lot of people don't catch. I want you to see this. And afterward, everybody say afterward. Afterward Afterward what? After the time of sending the fishermen. Afterward, I will send for many hunters. They shall hunt them from every mountain, every hill, and out of the holes of the rocks. Why would we be in mountains and hills and in the holes of the rocks unless they were hiding, hiding, hiding for their lives? So there's coming a time, and I think you and I prophetically are seeing, sadly, the start of that, where the Jewish people, 70% of them who are not in Israel, in many of these nations are now being hunted. We had two weeks ago a case in a university here in the United States where young people, Jewish people, had locked themselves in a library out of fear of the other students. And most of these students who are protesting for the cause of Hamas have never met a Jewish person. They only know what they're doing. They're just, anyway, just deceived. It's very, 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 very deceptive. But you say, well, why do you think, Bruce, why do you think, Pastor, that there's such this ingrained hatred of Jewish people, even amongst people who have never even met a Jewish person. I'll tell you, because it's demonically inspired, satanically inspired. Why? why? Why do you think Satan hates Jewish people so much? It's because it's through the Jews that Messiah, that Jesus came. And it's to Israel that Jesus is coming back to, to the Mount of Olives. So there is this satanic hatred of all things Jewish and of the Jewish people. That's why I've said uh, with you guys, he, the enemy has literally ripped the Jewish roots of the scriptures from the church for 2,000 years. And just now the Holy Spirit's starting to restore those things and an interest in those things. So there is this demonic spirit that is at work. But how many of you know that what the devil means for evil, God will turn and use for good? Someone say amen. amen. How many of you know it's true in your life? That's also true in the life of countries and of nations and of peoples. Amen. So the good news is what the devil means for evil, God will use it to work for good. Amen. So how's he going to work it for good? He's going to use it as a method, as a means to encourage the 70% of the Jews who are not in Israel to go back to the nation of Israel. It was interesting, this last week I saw a news headline, and it said this. It said, should the Jews of Germany be prepared to move to Israel? And it said that because now they're painting swastikas, stickers, they're painting Jewish stars on their front doors, and I mean, this is not just Germany, but it's been pretty bad in Germany this last week. So, you know, again, the Holy Spirit, this may, uh, may uh, go down in, 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 in uh, what's the word I mean, in energy, this may go down for a little bit, but it's going to ramp back up in the future, and it's going to be even worse next time. And the Antichrist is going to also in his kingdom foment after the first three and a half years the destruction of the Jewish people. And it's during that time that they will turn to Christ. Hallelujah, finally, amen, and turn to Messiah. So this is really, really interesting here. So again, you need to be aware that God can use what the devil means for evil taking place with the anti-Semitism to bring the Jewish people back to the land of Israel. Amen. Somebody asked me there, Pastor, when are you going? And I was like, when Jesus says, he hadn't told me to go yet, amen, by the way. So I'm still here, sorry. But you are stuck with me for a little while. But if he says go, just so you know, I'm going. I'm out of here, amen. 
off to the land I will go. Um, so that was the first part. Have you learned something there? Yeah. Awesome. So this next part, this is one of those, um, there is no such thing as a small Bible prophecy, but this is one of those Bible prophecies that you'll never hear taught anywhere. If you go to a, a Bible prophecy conference, you'll never hear this at most of them. Uh, matter of fact, most of you, I would guess, will have never heard what I'm going to teach you, but it is a prophecy I'm going to show you. And I'm going to show you it hasn't come to pass yet. And what's fascinating, and one of the things you have to be careful with Bible prophecy, just so you know, and of course, fancy word is eschatology, right? The study of end time events, is that the word of God is layered like an onion. Have you ever peeled an onion? You have the inner piece of the onion, then you have a wrapping and a wrapping and a wrapping. Then on top of that, you have each wrapping has a thin, translucent skin as well. And it's like you go and go and go deeper and deeper and deeper till you get to the core of the onion. There are many Bible prophecies that have come to pass, then came to pass again, and will come to pass a third time. Are you following me? So sometimes you're reading something, it's like, well, that's already happened. The abomination of desolation, for instance, give you an example. How many of you know that's prophesied in Matthew 24 that the future Antichrist is going to set up his image in the temple, right? But there have been other abomination of desolations that took place when the Greeks uh, splattered the pig's blood in the holy temple and put the image of uh, their, their leader uh, they're in the temple to be worshipped as God. That was an abomination of desolation. But that's not the ultimate one that's coming. So I say all that to say Bible prophecy is layered. But with this prophecy, what's fascinating is, in all of history, it's never happened yet. So that's how you're going to know. Now, what is Elam? Let's talk about it. Who is Elam? How many of you know that the Bible gives ancient names for modern nations, right? The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, the prophet, against Elam in the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah. Now, Elam, I can tell you, is the modern nation of Iran. The modern nation of Iran. Um, historically, the Iranian nation before they were Iran was Media Persia, where Persians, you may not know that, they were not Arabs, they were Persians. But before they were known as Persia, they were Elam. Everybody say Elam. Elam. So you got to go back pretty far to find them. Now, how many of you know, again, God loves all people? Jesus died for the Iranian people just like he died for the American people and the Jewish people and every other people group on the earth. Amen? And what's fascinating, this gives me chills thinking about this, right now in history, the Iranian people have been going through this revival of dreams and visions, and so many Iranians have become believers in Christ in the last two years that it literally is scaring the leadership of Iran. And the more they try to stamp it out, the bigger it gets. Now, that's the good news. The interesting news is Maybe God knows something that's going to happen about Iran, Elam, that we don't know. So let's look at that. And I really debated whether to share this with you, but then I said, you know, I felt the Holy Spirit nudge me towards a yes, because it's like when this does happen, at least you'll say, hey, that's amazing because we heard about that and that was taught, right? So in verse 35, it says, thus says the Lord of hosts, behold, I will break the bow of Elam, the foremost of the might. Now, whenever God says he's going to break the bow of a nation, he's talking about to whittle down their national soldiers, their power, to break their army, okay? To break the bow of Elam is literally to destroy the ability of that nation to make war. And this is pretty fascinating. Let's look at this. He says, against Elam... I will bring the four winds from the four quarters of heaven and scatter them toward all those winds. There shall be no nation where the outcast of Elam will not go. So here God prophesies that the citizenry of the nation of Iran one day will have an event happen 
inside that nation that will cause the people of that nation to flee from their land and to scatter into all the nations of the world. That's never happened. What could it be? Well, you read some commentary. Some say it could be a nuclear accident that takes place in Iran. Others say it could be a nuclear weapon that's dropped on Iran. I'm not sure. It could be an asteroid. It could be something totally and completely from God. Are you following me? But God gives us a clue here in a little bit that I'm going to read for you that it's another weapon or that it's an army and pretty fascinating. So look at what he says here. He says that the people of Elam, the Iranian people, are going to be scattered to the four winds. They're going to become outlast, outcast, and they're going to be literally going into all the nations. There's not a single nation they're not going to flee to. Then in verse 37, he says, For I will cause Elam to be dismayed before their enemies, and before those who seek their life, I will bring disaster upon them, my fierce anger, says the Lord, and I will send the sword against them until I've consumed them. So the sword is whenever God raises up another nation to bring destruction to a land. Are you following me? Now, listen to me. How many of you know God always has a purpose and always has a plan? Amen? And when you're talking about a national entity, that's, again, listen, when you hear about some evil thing the Iranians are doing or whatever on the news, don't allow your flesh to get all worked up. You need to pray for those people, amen? Because God's will that all men should be saved and none should perish, amen? So you pray for the Iranian people. But I will tell you prophetically that something, we don't know what, we can speculate till we're blue in the face, but something's going to happen where a sword, another army, a weapon, something comes into the nation of Iran and causes the people to have to flee their land, to have to flee their land. And that's not happened yet. In verse 38, he says, the Lord says, I will set my throne in Elam. Now, this is fascinating. You'll like this one, Tim. This is the only place in Scripture where the Lord says he's going to put his throne anywhere else except for Jerusalem. Now, this is during the millennium. Now, why would he put his throne in Elam? I don't know. His main throne's going to be in Jerusalem. How many of you know that? It says that in several places. But this is the only place other than the scriptures that talk about his throne being in Jerusalem and in Israel. They says his throne will be in Elam. He will destroy from there the kings and princes, says the Lord, which tells me from there, from that throne, he's going to also judge the nations from that place. Then he says, but it shall come to pass in the latter days. I will bring back the captives of Elam, says the Lord. So during the reign of Christ, when he establishes his kingdom, he will bring back all the people that have been scattered from what we know, modern Elam, which is Iran, and will bring them back to their land, those who are believers in Christ. And that's why I say it's so fascinating that there's been revival taking place throughout the nation of Iran that you're not going to hear about on Fox News or CNN, but trust me when I tell you I've heard firsthand accounts of all the many hundreds of thousands of people coming to Christ and have come to Christ in the nation of Iran. So it kind of fits that there's something tragic down the road that's going to happen to their nation. So I wanted to share that with you. So we said that Elam is an ancient civilization that was located in what is now Iran and predates the Persian Empire. Iran's people, it tells us, are going to be scattered throughout the nations. Has not happened, but will happen. The Lord will have a throne in Iran during the reign of Christ. From it, we do know that he's going to judge the kings and the princes at the beginning. Okay, how that all works out and plays out, we don't know. I'm not going to speculate, but it's pretty, pretty, pretty simple what it says, right? The people of Iran will be able to return to their land at that time the believers who make it through the tribulation period alive. Amen? And the last part that I want to talk to you about this morning as we start to come in for a landing. Everybody say, come in for a landing. Prophecy to destroy and divide Israel. Now, we're not coming in for a crash landing, so give me a couple minutes here. Prophecy to destroy and divide Israel. Psalm 83. I shared this with a pastor friend of mine this last week. This scripture of the Holy Spirit showed me out of Psalm 83 because, again, it is prophetic in that it's taking place. As you and I are sitting here, this is going on 
in the nations of the world today. It says, a song, a psalm of Asaph, do not keep silent, O God, do not hold your peace, and do not be still, O God. For behold, your enemies make a tumult, and those who hate you have lifted up your head. They have taken crafty counsel against your people and consulted together against your sheltered ones. Now, I'm going to skip forward to something about that word for sheltered ones, and we're going to come back and read the rest of the verse. So let me go through here real quick. I want to read this. So the Hebrew word translated as sheltered ones in verse 3 is safan. Everybody say safan. And that word safan, the basic meaning is to hide, to treasure, to store up. It often has a sense of hiding something valuable or treasuring it. The psalmist is speaking of nations conspiring against Israel, referring to them, the psalmist, the Holy Spirit, uh, 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 referring to them as God's safan, as God's treasure, carries the idea of them being his treasured, hidden, or protected ones. Listen, the Jewish people are God's chosen people because of his covenants with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, not because they're better people than anybody else. Do you understand that? It's simply because of the promises of God. Amen? And the Bible teaches us, and I'll teach this in in another message in our day, that many of them are enemies of the cross, those who don't believe in Messiah, but they're beloved of the Father because of his covenants with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Until the end days when God saves eventually all of Israel. Someone say amen. So here, it's interesting though, in Psalm 83, I want to go back to that, where he says, and he calls them his sheltered ones, and again, it's Saphon, it's his treasured ones. And I think treasured would have been a better Uh, translation that word right there so the nations have consulted together because they are wanting to destroy God's treasure they have said come and let us cut them off from being a nation how many of you know that's what you hear for now tens of thousands of thousands thousands of people in all these nations around the world marching and they're literally making that chant from the river to the sea Have you heard about that? So the river is the River Jordan. The sea is the Mediterranean Sea. And FYI, the land between the River Jordan and Mediterranean is called Israel, right? They call it occupied territory. Well, listen, there's never been a nation in Palestine. That word Palestine came from the Roman Empire. They called the destroyed land of Israel Palestine in 70 AD when they killed 1.1 million Jews during the, the 6th Roman legion besieging of Jerusalem. And I shared that with you guys a couple weeks ago. So there is no occupied land. How many of you know that God, very specifically, and another day will go through, gave that land and promised that land to the nation of Israel. And when Jesus comes back, he literally is going to parcel out the land as he promised. And there's nobody can say squat about it. Sorry, just the way it is. Amen? Amen. He's God, we're not. Someone say amen. Amen. And it says here, it says they've consulted together against your sheltered ones. Verse 4, they have said, come, let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel may be remembered no more. And you know what's interesting about that? China came under a lot of heat this week because uh, several of these Chinese Uh, corporations and uh, other entities have literally erased Israel off of the map. Now, the communist government came and said, well, we weren't responsible. But listen, if you know anything about China, nobody does anything without their permission. They just don't. So Israel was literally wiped off the map. And it's prophesied that these nations literally want the name of Israel to be remembered no more. Now, I'm telling you to explain to you that this is the start and the ongoing spiritual battle that God has forewarned us about that is going to be taking place at the end of the age. And you and I have the pleasure or displeasure, depending on your viewpoint, of living through that time. Amen? Now, for me, it doesn't bother me because to me, it builds my faith. 
I mean, we live in exciting times, amen? Times when you can still go out and share the gospel like our evangelism team did. They cast the demon out of this lady, and she gave her life to Jesus. She was literally praying a prayer to ask the Holy Spirit to fill her life, and a demon manifest. And they literally cast, and she had no idea. She was like, I don't know what that was. They told me the story. It was pretty amazing. So listen, you and I have an opportunity between now and then to be reflecting Christ to the world. Amen? Amen. Are you bored or are you still with me? All right, coming in for a landing still now. On our descent, the Hebrew word translated sheltered ones we said was literally treasure or safon, okay? Um, So we said that the desire of the surrounding nations, verse 4, will be to destroy the nation of Israel and erase its memory from history. And if you think there's anti-Semitic stuff going on now, I'm warning you, you've not seen anything. Yeah, I'm warning me because I'm actually Jewish. You haven't seen anything yet to what's coming, to what's coming. So hold on to your hats. Now, do we stand with Israel? Absolutely we do. Amen? Absolutely we do. 100%. Why? Because God stands with Israel. Why? Because of his covenant promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Amen? And because one day they will become brothers and sisters in Messiah. Joel chapter 3, verse 1 through 3. For behold, in those days at that time and at that time, when I bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem, that started again 1946, 1947, Israel became a nation, 1948, but still 70% of the Jewish people are still outside of the nation of Israel. So at that time, when I bring together captives of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations and bring them down to the Valley of Jehoshaphat. Everybody say Valley of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat. Now, they say that this Valley of Jehoshaphat is not there yet. So I want you to hear me. I'm going to give you a little preview of what's coming. The Bible teaches that when Jesus returns, and you read about that in Revelation, when Jesus returns riding on a white horse with myriads and myriads, that's the Greek, with thousands upon thousands, innumerable hosts of saints with him, that's in the book of Jude, when he sets his feet on the Mount of Olives, It tells us that there is going to be a great earthquake and there is going to be a valley that forms. And as that valley forms, the future name of that valley is going to be the Valley of Jehoshaphat. And it's in that valley that he will enter into judgment with the nations on account of his people, his heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations. And look at this last part. They have also, what to his land? divided up my land. So this tells me between now and then, that's going to happen. They're going to try to divide up his land again. They've been trying for, for since Israel became a nation, but they're going to try some more between now and that time. But one day, Jesus is going to be on his throne. He's going to be there overseeing the Valley of Jehoshaphat, and he's going to bring judgment to the nations. Does it say that anywhere in the New Testament as well? Well, yes, it does. We're going to look at that in a minute. Verse 3 says, They have cast lots for my people, have given a boy as payment for a harlot, and sold a girl for wine that they may drink. Now, this is coming during, I believe, the last three and a half years of the Antichrist. I'm giving you a lot of information. We're going to go back and dissect it in the weeks to come. But the future Antichrist, I believe, is going to be Jewish by blood, but it's going to be Islamic. And he's going to lead and come back as the coming fulfillment of the 12th Mahdi, the 12th prophet that Islam's been looking for. And it's amazing because everything in the Islamic scriptures is opposite of everything in the Bible. The Islamic Savior is our Antichrist. The Islamic Jesus is our false prophet, one who looks like a lamb and deceives and points people to worship the Antichrist. And their villain who comes to save Israel is our Jesus. So there's satanically inspired scripture that are the exact opposite of God's scripture. So I say all that to say that 
The Bible teaches during the last three and a half years, Jerusalem is going to be trampled underfoot of the Gentiles once again. And that's when this right here, those who get caught, the Jews, are going to be sold and it's going to be just horrible. That's where Jesus tells them to flee, right? Pray that your fleeing is not on the Sabbath, right? So Israel restored the Valley of Jehoshaphat. It's the prophetic valley that's to be formed when Jesus re returns. Matthew 25, 31, 32, when the Son of Man is glory and all the holy angels with him, when he will sit on the throne of his glory, all the nations will what? Be gathered before him. He will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides the sheep from the goats. That will be in the Valley of Jehoshaphat. We just read the Old Testament prophecy, and Jesus, again, gives us a little more detail about it in Matthew 25. And the reason is they divided up the land, they sold and kidnapped his people. Sound familiar? <clears throat> Daniel chapter 17, verse 37 through 39. As we close, he shall, he, the future Antichrist, shall regard neither the God of his fathers nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall exalt himself above them all. But in their place he shall honor a God of fortresses, and a God which his fathers did not know he shall honor with gold and silver, with precious stones and pleasant things. Thus he shall act against the strongest fortresses with a foreign God which he shall acknowledge, and advance its glory, and he shall cause them to rule over many. Now, all that I'm not, that's detail I'll give you in the future, in weeks to come. But the main part of that's the last part I highlight in green, the Antichrist and divide the land for gain. So it's the Antichrist who will set up to divide the land of Israel for gain. Do you see that? And it's prophesied in, again, the book of Daniel. And our last scripture, stand to our feet if you would. Revelation chapter 11, verse 1 and 2. Then I was given a reed like a measuring rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. But leave out the court which is outside the temple, and do not measure it. Look at this, this prophecy, for it has been given to the who? Gentiles. Everybody say Gentiles. Gentiles. Now, for those of you who don't know what a Gentile is, a Gentile is anybody who's non-Jewish. Okay, it's not a bad thing can be a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. If you're not Jewish, you're a Gentile, okay? Jew, Gentile. Pastor Brian, I joke with him. I call him Pastor G, right? Pastor Gentile, he calls me Pastor J, right? Pastor Jew. Jew and Gentile. Now look at this. It was given to the Gentiles, and they will tread the holy city underfoot for what? 42 months. How long is 42 months? Three and a half years. This is the last three and a half years of the tribulation. Now listen to me, guys. The tribulation period is literally seven years. But the last half of that tribulation period is called the Great Tribulation. It's the last three and a half years. It's the time known as the time of Jacob's trouble, okay? The whole seven years is called the 70th week of Daniel. But that three and a half year period is the time of Jacob's trouble. It's a time of distress and tribulation trouble, the likes of which the Bible says the world has never seen. And that God had to shorten the days because if he did not, there would be no flesh left alive. And those are the days ahead. But you and I today are believers and we're seeing some of this start to play out in ways that some people are like, wow. Now I knew it was coming. I couldn't have told you how, but I knew it was coming. And so when these things come, let not your heart be troubled. Why? Because you believe in Jesus. You're full of faith. You're walking in the Holy Spirit. Let all the other world cower in fear and anxiety and stress. But let you and I know that our faith is in the risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the King of glory. Amen? Amen. Can we give him a hand clap? Hallelujah, Lord. Glory to God. Bless you, Jesus. Every head bowed, every eye closed.